Greetings and blessings YouTube, this is John the Jansenist and this particular video is going to discuss some fairly recent events, although not exactly current. I don't normally do political uh, subjects on this particular channel, but occasionally there are instances where church and state meet. Unlike the famed credo by Thomas Jefferson, where there ought to be a separation of church and state, in realistic terms this doesn't really exist. And so the question that we naturally have to ask ourselves is, are we living in a republic? Are we living in a theocracy? Or are we living in some other form of dictatorship, sacred or secular? In keeping with this, the particular article that I'm going to read is about a month old and it de deals specifically with the current chaplain of the House of Representatives. And I'm just going to preface this by stating the following. There has been a recent tradition amongst the Congress, particularly the House of Representatives, giving the onslaught of prominent Roman Catholic members to nominate Jesuit priests as the chaplain of the Congress. Speaking for myself, as a dissenter, someone who has basically been forced outside the boundaries of Rome, I take great offense to this. There is nothing more contradictory to the spirit of America than the notion of a Jesuit presiding over the house of the people in the United States of America. The, the history of this holy order has been very well documented and anyone who has any question on this subject should read further into it and I've provided some selected works down in the description below for anyone who wishes to research this topic further but suffice to say the tradition of America is not Jesuit the only colony of the original 13 that can claim any kind of Jesuit leaning tendencies is Maryland and even then it wasn't a uniformly Jesuit colony. Nevertheless if one of the state houses where there is a Roman Catholic majority wishes to nominate a Jesuit chaplain they are free to do so provided that that body of congressmen has no effect over me in my life. I literally feel like a captive in a foreign land every time I see the current chaplain and his predecessors preside over the house at the beginning of each day of every session. In keeping with that we must understand a few things about the current House of Representatives and that is that the two most prominent figures in Congress, the Speaker of the House, John Boehner, and the minority leader Nancy Pelosi are both Roman Catholic and I am very sorry to say under the influence of the Jesuit order and you can tell that primarily by the people that they have chosen to nominate but a little bit of a conundrum has occurred a little rift between the Jesuits which is actually not terribly uncommon when you understand the order a little bit better and how cultish they tend to be. There's always going to be dissenters and they're usually going to receive treatment just like this. This, uh, this uh, article is titled Nancy Pelosi Turns on Jesuit Chaplain Nominee and this was written by Catherine Jean Lopez on May 11th of this year. There is a roll call story today that suggests that bad vetting went into the nomination of a new chaplain in the House, Friar Pat Conroy. It also suggests that Nancy Pelosi is all too willing to throw the good priest under the Beltway bus, as they say. Friar Conroy is being implicated in a settlement involving accusations that have nothing to do with him. In fact, to the extent it has anything to do with him, he appears to be the hero of the story, as Roll Call explains. The very revered Patrick Lee, superior of the Oregon province of the Society of Jesus, 
said in a statement that he is deeply disappointed by the reaction to Conroy's nomination. Father Conroy is an excellent priest worthy of the nomination made by Speaker Boehner, Lee said. He has never been the subject of an allegation of child abuse. The Reverend Patrick Howell, a member of the Oregon Promise and Re Province and rector of the Jesuit community at Seattle University, where Conroy worked for four years in the 1990s, said that the most incidents of abuse happened decades ago and that the per perpetrators are under supervision and very restricted. Safeguards were put in to protect children. We all go through a training each year, both for the Archdiocese and Jesuit Order, he said. If anything, we're probably better qualified to reach out to people in need and to understand the different trials and crises that people go through. Just to stop right there. It is my understanding that the Jesuit Order, which is renowned for its philosophical casuistry and moral relativism, has been very deeply in implicated in the recent child abuse scandals. And just for everybody's information, I am a former Roman ca Catholic, and as of late 2007, I left the faith for the old Catholic Church, in part because of this scandal, and also, to a greater extent, because of theological study and beginning to understand that over the course of the past 500 years, the Roman Catholic Church has really gone downhill. But I digress, continuing with the story. Those safeguards were not yet in place in 1986 when Conroy, three years out of college, informed a superior about a Roman Catholic priest whom he suspected of abusing a boy. The Seattle Times reported in 2002 that Conroy wrote a letter in 1986 to then Seattle Archbishop Raymond Hunthausen stating that a boy told him that he had been abused by a priest when he was 12 or 13 at a parish in Snomhish, Washington. As Bill Donahue succinctly puts it, Reverend Patrick Conway was selected by House Speaker John Boehner to be the new House Chaplain, and within no time the Jesuit priest won the plaudits of many Catholics, including Rep. Representative Nancy Pelosi. But now Pelosi is having second thoughts, citing Conroy's association with the Oregon province of the Society of Jesus. Why? Because of claims of sexual abuse made against these Jesuits. Were these were their accusations against made against Father Conroy? No. Are the accusations recent? No. They extend back decades. Did Father Conroy have any role to play? Yes. He was a whistleblower who reported at least one case of an abusive priest. Speaker Boehner's office wholeheartedly refutes the suggestion that the vetting process for the chaplain nomination left anything to be desired. Both Speaker Boehner and Democratic leader Pelosi reviewed Father Conroy's background and interviewed him before the Speaker selected him to be our next chaplain, a senior aide tells me. Capitol Police, House Counsel, and the Chief Administrative Officer all vetted the Jesuit priest. He was subject to a criminal background check, court records, credit checks, public record checks, and an IRS check. The settlement never came up because it had nothing to do with Father Conroy. Boehner spokesman tells me, the settlement of claims against the Society of Jesus in Oregon is the result of abuse that occurred in the 1960s and 1970s, not during the time of Vatican II, I might add, before Father Conroy became a Jesuit. It has been widely reported, including in the New York Times. The lawsuit had nothing at all to do with Father Conroy. Further, Father Conroy did hear an allegation of an instance of abuse in 1986. He took immediate and appropriate action, notifying his superiors in the church. Representative Pelosi's staff was aware of that incident. Boehner's office continues its full-throated support of the priest. Father Conroy was honest and candid, candid with the Speaker and Representative Pelosi throughout the selection process, and the Speaker is confident he will be a great chaplain for the entire House of Representatives community. When the chaplain announcement was made last week, Father Conroy had the support of the former Speaker. Nothing has happened that should have changed that. Nancy Pelosi has been known to ignore that which is a political headache to her, including when coming from nuns. Owes more, owes the nominee more. Basic fairness. Is there a prayer that other members of Congress do 
due diligence and read to the end of the story. Anti-Catholicism used to keep Catholics from such positions. Now it's incompetence and cowardice that gets in the way. And that concludes the article. Obviously, it's a pro-Roman Catholic article. I am going to close this out by just saying, speaking directly to my fellow Catholics, both inside and outside the Roman Church. The thing that needs to be understood about the Jesuit order is that they are under no obligation by virtue of their own oath to be honest and forthcoming to anybody except to each other. They are not even obligated to be honest to a particular pope. Their loyalty is to the papacy, but not necessarily to a sitting pope. They've been disbanded by a pope previously. They owe no allegiance to the Dominicans, the Franciscans, both of whom have been defending the church far longer than the Jesuits have existed, and they definitely have nothing but contempt for anyone who asserts the sovereign grace and irresistible, unfailing grace of God as explained by the most revered St. Augustine and by the apostles of the Apostolic Church in the epistles of the New Testament. The Jesuit order is extremely unpredictable, and it could very well be that this entire incident is nothing more than a power play on the part of Nancy Pelosi, who has proven herself to be a very adept Jesuit in the art of subterfuge and deception. I have nothing but contempt for her. I am wary and guarded of Speaker Boehner because of his associations, but I am outright combative when it comes to individuals like Nancy Pelosi. People who preach the grandness and greatness of abortion on demand and yet have multitudes of children. There's only one purpose for that. She is doing her part in the, in the eventual takeover of this country by proxy through the democratic process. You'll note that most Catholics that are still in good standing with the papacy have not shied away from the personal aspects of not practicing birth control and having large families, even though they preach from the pulpit, either in Congress or in the church, that this is something that should be pushed on everybody outside of Rome, be they Protestant, be they Baptistic, Anabaptistic, or Old Catholic. For those with eyes to see and ears to hear, there's something rotten in D.C. here, and it's been rotten for a long time. And this particular story is just another case where the rot has gotten so pervasive that there is today no honor among thieves. I look forward to comments. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti, God be with you all.